song went out before it got to the good bit. Oh, there's a really fast bit. There's, the idea behind that song is it starts off really slow, and then it speeds up really, really quickly, and it, they basically sing at the pace that I speak at. So uh, I got 50 minutes, uh, although it says 24 in there, uh, <laughs> to, to get through this talk. Um, and I want to talk about the future of the web. I want to talk about where it's going. Progressive web applications are here. Um, it was kind of given away a little bit uh, at the time uh, about Safari kind of coming through on the platform as well. Um, and I want to talk about some problems that I still think that we have on the web. And it's kind of this idea of siloization. I worry about things kind of getting pushed into silos. And this all stemmed, and the, most of this talk stemmed from some research that I was doing around iOS 11. Uh, and it, it's good. Uh, Safari has introduced things like drag and drop and a bunch of other stuff as well. And the great thing about drag and drop is that you can take files from the user's machine and drop it into the web page, but it's nearly impossible to get the content back out of the web page and back onto the system. And it's not an iOS thing. Like, this happens across every single platform, whether it's desktop, whether it's Android, whether it's Chrome. Like, things get locked away inside the platform. And I, I really worry about the future of the web when we can't actually interchange information between web pages. And I want to talk a little bit about that because I do think it's a long-term challenge for the web. And I really dislike the idea of silos on the web. Like, they're this kind of thing that kind of, they block, like, like they're our final kind of resort in terms of like having this kind of complete and open ecosystem. Uh, and unfortunately, it's nearly impossible to escape the silos at the moment that are kind of arriving on the mobile platform. So I want to talk about mobile platforms uh, and other kind of platforms around the ecosystem, not just the web today as well. So I did start a project kind of to break down the silos a long time ago called Web Intense. It was actually done in, two, we started it in 2010. Um, and the idea behind this was that your application should be able to kind of give control to the user to perform common tasks. If you want to edit an image, you should be able to edit an image that's on a web page inside another web application on your site or inside your browser without having to go through any installs, without having to discover the services, and without the developer having to tightly couple kind of an image editor into their kind of web application. And we, we created the API, we landed it in Chrome, and there's some nice news at the bottom that says, you know, Safari, or not Safari, uh, Microsoft is starting to work, uh, not Microsoft, Mozilla is starting to work towards this API. Um, but the problem was, in 2012, uh, we, an we announced that we were removing it from the web platform. We were removing it from Chrome. There's a number of different reasons, which I'm really ha I'll be happy to go through, as well, about why this kind of failed. A lot of it was about user experience. Um, we didn't have a great kind of programming model. And it turned out we had a whole load of different arguments with Mozilla about how this should be implemented. And stubbornness and the way that we kind of designed this API meant that the VP of Chrome at the time was just like, I don't think we need it. And you know, it's fair enough. We had a lot of different problems at the time. Um, but I want to talk about kind of since then where we've been kind of moving the web platform towards as well. And our traditional view of the web is that it's this one platform that unifies all these different kind of devices. So iOS, Android, obviously the desktop, you know, the way that people use applications on the web is mostly on desktop. The web in theory is the most open platform available and it's available to the most users on uh, across the globe. But when I went to India about three years ago, and I, I live in Liverpool, uh, and the Beatles obviously came from Liverpool, and they did this kind of uh, massive, I say mass migration, they didn't do a migration to India, but they went to India to study. I went to India for two or three weeks, and I've been a couple of times, uh, quite a few times uh, ever since. But the way that kind of mobile is being introduced and the way that computing is being introduced into, you know, basically the next two, three billion users across the globe, uh, India being the, one of the primary ones, is, is quite different from the way that we experience kind of mobile computing and desktop computing on the web. Mobile is the only way that the majority of Indians at the moment are actually experiencing advanced computing. Um, and it is completely different. So the traditional way uh, that they, I say they is the wrong way of saying it, um, but when we went across to India, we spoke to a lot of businesses and a lot of developers and they just did not care about the web. You know, the web was on desktop and it was fine for them to be on desktop. But these experiences like on iOS and Android, Android in particular, is that everyone needed a native application. They didn't want a website. They didn't need an access to these kind of experiences. Like even shopping sites, they got rid of their mobile website and just made a native application. And it turned out in the long run that it was actually a bad idea. But this is the kind of the first and probably the biggest kind of set of silos that we've seen uh, that are a big threat to the web. If you want to have some functionality, the only way that you can get to it is, to via, is via downloading it from one of these stores. And the web isn't integrated into those platforms. But that's not actually the big issue on the 
the, on the web at the moment, or on mobile computing in particular, it's actually the applications that are actually installed via those silos. They themselves are being uh, building silos themselves. So obviously, there's like kind of all the, and by the way, I hand drew these. These are the worst images ever, but I just thought it's a nice touch. Um, we've got things like Facebook, Line, WeChat, you know, Google to some extent as well, all building these applications which are deployed to over a billion users each and are being used actively all the time. And they're all making their own individual platforms about how users can access content and interact with those experiences. You know, Facebook has got business pages, instant and out articles. It's got some bots and chat clients. WeChat's doing the same thing. Line is doing a similar thing. iOS has got Apple News, all trying to create these new platforms for consuming and interacting with experience. And I think the reason why they do this is, one, there's a whole bunch of new users come into these platforms. They don't have web development experience, but they want to interact with the, like, the next billion users, the next set of users that are coming through to these platforms. And it's actually really hard to build a website today. You have to set up a server, you have to get HTTPS, you have to do a whole bunch of other stuff. And if your platform is the easiest thing to deploy to, and the majority of your users are there, that's where the users are going to go. And I think this is a long-term threat for the web. But the thing is, for me, is like the web is full of silos themselves. And I, I don't want to pick on Facebook, because it's not, not necessarily. Like Google has got things like Google Photos. It's where you put all your photos. It's a great web application. And it's a great application on the mobile device as well. Um, but if you want an image editor, you want to edit those images, there's no real easy way to actually have access to those photos and to be able to edit them on the web. I'm not complaining against Google Photos. I like Google Photos. Um, but like, if you want to have an image editor, you have to use the tools that are provided by the platform or by the application themselves. That is kind of, in essence, a silo, right? You ha if you want to use it, you put all your data in, and at some point, there might be a tax applied uh, to actually interacting with those platforms. And people can generate revenue. When, you know, when all the users are in those platforms, people can generate revenue through those as well. So I think our goal, and my goal is kind of the, the lead of the Chrome DevRel team uh, inside Google, at least anyway, is we want to make sure that we can kind of make the web an equal partner on all platforms. And you know, the DevRel team themselves can't do a huge amount outside of like educating people and explaining where the platforms go. And it's the engineering teams and the platform teams. But we want the web to be equal. We want it to be integrated into all these other different platforms, whether it's in Facebook, whether it's in Google inside a native application, uh, or whatever at that point. So we've been spending a bunch of time having this tight focus on specifically mobile and how we bring users and developers alike, because that's where the biggest amount of growth has been. And to some extent, we've kind of not necessarily left desktop behind, but we haven't put as much effort as possible into the desktop experiences. So the biggest goal that we had uh, was we were trying to decide to focus on ensuring that the time the user spent on device was on the web and not inside native applications. One of the really nice kind of stories that we've got is, uh, one of the PMs came up to me and said, Paul, we need to keep media on the web. Flash is going to go away at some point, and we don't want media experiences, just video consumption, to go into native applications. We want users to be able to hit a URL, start to interact, and start to use the experience as well from there. I think that's a really good idea. Is like We've got a number of different kind of applications, media apps, social media apps, games. We want all these to be accessible, not only just kind of the normal content. We want it to be accessible in the browser via your, a URL and accessible. And this is where we spent a huge amount of our time on the platform. And as you can see, over the, uh, what we're going to talk about in a minute is you can see where we've tried to invest in kind of things like capabilities. Mobile was the platform that we were aiming for. And we spent a huge amount of time making sure that the mobile web and the desktop web, to some extent as well, is just as feature rich as you'd expect the experiences on native to be. So the last five years, we've had a huge number of different uh, experiences come through. We've got access to the camera, and we can manipulate the data coming from there. We can get access to the microphone, so we can record the user or uh, any kind of other things around inside there. We can get access to the network information. We can control the network as well through Service Worker. We can understand the kind of the different types of permissions that the user has granted to the application. We can get things like notifications as well, and not uh, location notifications, and integration with uh, native sharing platforms as well. So we're starting to bring like the web experiences closer to the user in all the expected places that they want their like their native applications to be, which I think is good. We've also spent a huge amount of time trying to improve the payments process. So there's a payment request API. Uh, that's kind of landed on the, on the platform. Apple have got Apple Pay, and they're committed to actually doing uh, the payment request API as well. But the idea behind this is it's, like it's incredibly hard, especially on mobile, to collect the user information 
uh, for credit card information to be able to complete a purchase and then actually do it. It's really, really hard to do. And we're trying to build up an API which can just collect all this information, give it to the website so that they can process the payment information themselves. And the idea is it's all managed by the browser, it's all managed by the platform, so that all you really have to do is integrate with the API and then pass the details to the payment processing system. And this is the demo that I, I well, it's, it's a real site, WeGo. It's a, an e a travel a commerce site. Uh, but this is a demo that I made for Google I.O. And I managed to book a flight within 20 seconds from kind of launching the application straight through. I had to cut out some of my passport information uh, from this. Um, but like 20 seconds to complete a purchase, end-to-end -end book a flight. And I didn't actually realize I was booking the flight at the time. So when I put my CVC number in, I would booked a flight from Athens to Jeddah. And I was like, oh, I had to pay for it. And I couldn't get out of it at the time. <laughs> So anyway, we, so we're trying to smooth out payments. We're also trying to smooth out other kind of major points of friction on the mobile platform on the, on the web platform. You know, getting a user into your site and then engaged and actually being able to get their details so that you can have them as a logged in and signed in user is incredibly hard. So we've been working on this idea of the, like the, the uh, credential management API, uh, which the idea behind that is that you can sign a user in on mobile uh, they create an account, they put their password in, and then it's synchronized and stored through the kind of the Chrome of Chrome at this point. And then when you go to your desktop device, it knows that you've already got an account and it can automatically sign you back in. So we're trying to hook up all these different experiences. Wherever the web is, wherever the user is, we'll be able to kind of link all these things together. And there's a number of other browsers also starting to implement these kind of APIs to actually smooth out the overall user experience, which I think is pretty powerful. We've also been doing some deeper integration on the media stack as well. So, you know, we've got things like the ability to control uh, videos uh, just via things like watch. But the idea behind this is that you could pull down from the top, you can go to the lock screen, you can control your video uh, via the media session API. You can control the video, pause, play, restart, and kind of go to the next wide. Like you get deeper integration with the mobile media platforms as well. And we're starting to explore different APIs as well to give you access to, there we go. So we give you access to the um, underlying sensors of the device, so the, the generic sensor API. It's not fully deployed yet, um, but developers are working on it at the moment. And we can give you access to kind of ambient light data so that you can do, well, not very interesting things in my case. I just wanted to sound an air horn when you covered the, the, the camera up. Um, but you could do a dark mode for like a normal site, so you can switch from white to black to black to white and a bunch of other things. But the more important thing is with the generic sensor API, we can start to expose more sensor data to more users for more things as well. So if you've got magnetometers, if you've got uh, compasses and other different kind of accelerometers as well, we can start to get all that data and fuse it together to be able to build, you know, to be fair, this type of experience has been available on native platforms for a long time. But we can, we can start to get access to a lot more data and a lot more information that is happening on the system at that point. But it's not just about the experiences that kind of directly affect your device. We want to make sure that the web can bridge out to other devices around it. So things like the web Bluetooth API, just normal JavaScript, the user can select uh, a Bluetooth device that they want to connect to. They can connect to it and then, oh, wrong one, sorry. Um, they can connect to it. Uh, <laughs> completely put off. Uh, they can connect to it, they can control it just via normal Bluetooth LE at that point. I think that's incredibly powerful. We've got a range of devices around us which we can start to interact with and control all without having to actually install an application. And my long-term goal for this is that we can get someone like Fitbit to rather than say when you get the Fitbit out of your um, out of the box and put it on your wrist, you can just basically say, cool, just go to this URL and set up your device and it's there. You don't need to have an application installed. And then there's a number of other different kind of more industrial kind of experiences as well that we want to enable and integrate with. NFC. We've been able to read from NFC because the Android phones have always had the ability to read an NFC chip, but we've never been able to do anything with it. But now with the NFC API, which is going to land pretty soon, we'll be able to read and write kind of to NFC cards. And this for the consumer web, probably isn't anything that you're going to use day to day, but if you're kind of a more industrial or more enterprise-based experience, you can start to build these experiences and have them deployed just through the web. And I think that's really, really powerful. And finally, and again, this is another one, and we've got, I've got some of my friends uh, over in uh, Copenhagen who are working on some of this as well, 
is that we can connect to USB devices around us at the time. As long as you can build the JavaScript API and the JavaScript driver, you can start to connect to these devices. And again, this might not be for the consumer web, but if you've got a legacy application or a legacy piece of hardware that you need to integrate with, but you want to deploy across a number of range of different customers that you have, like we can do that just via the web without having to any, have any kind of complex infrastructure in place. And finally, you know, WebAssembly, I don't know whether anyone's talking about WebAssembly at the moment, but the idea is we can bring 20 years worth of code to the web and we can execute it in a performant manner. I think that this is incredibly powerful. This is just basically doing real-time image uh, manipulation and image kind of uh, filters at the point. But you know, we can bring games and have them run at near native speeds. Like, this is going to be a big thing in the, in the near future and hopefully we'll be able to talk about it a little bit more. But I think fundamentally, the bit I want to try and get across is that you know, for a long time, Native has had all these kind of capabilities, and it's taken us years and years and years to be able to get to the point where we actually start to have some parity. And I think, I think this is actually really powerful, right? Like, we, we know that not every single browser has all the same consistent APIs, but they're going to get there, they're standardized, and when there's developer demand, browser vendors start to implement these features as well. So I'm actually really quite optimistic about the whole piece. And I think one piece that I want to kind of highlight is VR and AR. VR and AR is a very nascent piece of technology. <laughs> and um, it's a nascent technology, right? Like native applications aren't doing a huge amount. And like it's going to take maybe another three days until Apple introduced proper AR across all their mobile platforms. But the idea behind it is the web isn't that far behind. We've got web VR. VR is already on some of these platforms. We're going to have web AR and other different experiences coming through. And we're not that far behind these native platforms. And the really interesting thing for me about things like VR is that we can take these APIs that have come to the platform. You know, they, they might be native APIs at this point. Uh, like the VR APIs or the AR ones, but we can do it in a very web-like way. You can have one experience and cater for a huge amount of users. If you don't have JavaScript turned on, you just display the image. If you have JavaScript, maybe you can do kind of a pan and swipe kind of immersive mode. If you have gyroscopes, you know, the user can move the device around and pan through an image. And then if you have VR headsets, well, you can go into a full VR mode as well. Now, I mean, not every site needs VR, but I think the fact that we can get this and bring this to the web and have it kind of progressively enhanced and progressively accessible. It's a thing that differentiates the web from a lot of other different platforms as well. We can, I don't want to say write once, because it's the wrong way of saying it, but we can at least deploy once and have it nearly accessible everywhere at that point. The problem is, and everyone always says this, is that we're always kind of creating features and trying to catch up to native. It's like chasing a rainbow at that point. You see the rainbow, you run towards it, but you never actually get any closer. And I think that's a valid argument. Like, we don't want to have to basically you know, keep trying to catch up and try and best native on the things that native platforms are really good at. We should be able to differentiate ourselves. But I think, for me, the important point is that browser vendors and platform vendors have recognized the fact that we should be keeping pace with these platforms. We might lag behind a little bit in how these features get out onto the web and available to every single user, but that's okay. We can actually start to build really compelling experiences. And I, I look at this graph is completely made up, um, but the idea behind it was that in 2007 or 2008, 2009, when iPhone first came out, the only way that you could get applications onto the iPhone was via the web. And then, you know, Apple introduced a huge amount of APIs, app cache, media queries, web SQL database, to kind of build app-like experiences on the web. But they realized that wasn't actually what developers and users necessarily wanted. So they kind of accelerated their investments into the mobile platform, and the, the web just didn't keep pace. If you look at the Android browser, and I'm going to say this before Chrome kind of came along on the Android browser, on the Android systems, like the Android browser didn't evolve. It just wasn't loved, and people didn't actually invest their time into it. And since, since kind of Chrome came along, and obviously Microsoft and everyone has been, and Mozilla have been pushing on the mobile platforms, we started to see a huge amount of increase in the number of features that are coming through to the platform. And we're starting to catch up, and I don't think we'll ever catch up with native platforms, but I think that is okay. So, when we spoke to a lot of developers about what they want in terms of features, I think the interesting thing was not everyone wants web VR and these advanced APIs. They want some relatively simple things. They want placement on the home screen. They want the user, whether it's desktop or whether it's on their phone, is they want the experience to be you know, available for a user to quickly access. 
They want engagement through notifications as well. Obviously, if you're a developer or a business, you want to kind of provide users with relevant and timely information so that you can bring them back into your website. Now, obviously, you can like, annoy a lot of people with poorly designed notifications, but still, developers wanted it because that was the thing that was, that was the reason why they didn't build native applications. Oh, so why they didn't build web applications, they built native applications. And they wanted a simple offline and installed experience. And this kind of relates back to the kind of the, the placement on the home screen. But the theory is like if you click on something on the home screen or you click on a notification and you don't have data or you have a poor internet connection, the experience should still load. It should still be available to users to be able to kind of work with. Um, it doesn't have to be a complete install. I can have it fully installed on the device. Um, but actually, when you speak to a lot more users as well and developers, they start to want to get to, OK, it works offline. I want to progressively install it. I want it available in my application, in my device, where, and I expect it to be wherever it is. But the interesting thing is when you speak to a lot of users, and we've spoke to quite a few users, their, pro their priorities are quite different. They want to be able to find things. They want to be able to get things done quickly. And I mean, that's pretty much it. I mean, there's things like games and other stuff that they want to focus on. And there's a definite disparity between kind of the features and capabilities that we want to offer on the web uh, with some of the things that users actually want to be able to do with their compute power, their computing devices. So I, I didn't really know how to phrase this. We know the web is not equal to native. I don't think we have to chase uh, native all the time. We can definitely differentiate. But the differentiation points, and I, I kind of want to talk about these because we always keep forgetting kind of why the web is a special thing, um, is distribution and reach. That's the biggest thing that we have on the web platform. We have a link. We can give it to people. We can have it accessible on pretty much any device, anywhere possible. I think that's incredibly powerful. No other native platform and no other platform without a full-on install has that reach, the same reach that we have on the web. We also have a hyper-focus on speed. We can deliver experiences instantly. I know that we have a lot of arguments in the industry about, you know, does, should the page load in five seconds? It's bad if it loads in 20 seconds. But the fundamental point is if you give someone a URL, it is possible to give them an experience instantly. And that kind of obviates the need for an install sometimes. If it's instant and available, you know, the user doesn't, maybe doesn't have to install it at that point. Um, and the final piece is user experience as well. So we have the ability to smooth out a lot of flows. We have the ability to make the kind of the task of completing a purchase or make playing a game or whatever it is. We have the ability to work on it really or quite effectively. And we have the ability to manipulate it and update it and re-upload it to the server without having kind of a single silo or a central point to kind of have to go through to be able to deliver better user experiences. But the thing I really want to highlight is that everyone knows that distribution, the number one thing about the web and why the web is so powerful, is everyone wants to be like the web in terms of these experiences. So like in the 1970s, you had to go and buy all the pieces for a computer, take them home, bring it together, and then you had to write the software for it. And in the 80s, you could buy a fully made PC or a computer, and then you could just go and buy software from the store. And then the web comes along in the 90s, you type in a URL and you go to the experience and people start to build CGI gateway kind of uh, based experiences where you know, we have a nice way of uh, starting to kind of do business functionality, I want to say, on the web versus just content. But at the same time, in like the late 2000s, obviously the iPhone comes along and they have an app store, which makes it even easier to get installed experiences onto your device. Like the distribution and the effort of having a safe installed mechanism on the web on those mobile platforms is, is gone. And I think that's incredibly powerful. And the interesting thing is you can't see it very well, but I actually think that native platforms, they want that you click on a link and you get the native experience. And if you look at Android instant apps, that's really, I think that's a really long-term threat to the web as well in those type of things. And another thing that we see with distribution and reach is everyone says desktop is dead. And it might be not as prevalent in places like India, where mobile is the thing that's accelerating. But even in the US, like, you know, the time spent on device on mobile is still growing. But the thing is, like, the overall pie is growing. Like, we've still got a huge amount of users on desktop. And I worry that on the web, we focus on mobile a lot when we've got like, a huge amount of different ways that we can distribute content and get it into the hands of user. Time spent on device for desktop is still just as important. It just so happens that mobile is accelerating. It's just that the pie is getting bigger. I think we measured the thing wrong. When I think about distribution and reach and speed, uh, the other thing I like to think about is kind of like the headless web, the, the idea that you don't have to have a browser 
to be able to actually start to interact with the web experience. And the Guardian have done a number of different experiments where they just deliver push notifications, entire web applications delivered inside a notification. No install, no real download, you just go to the site, you enable push notification, and you have this rich and deep experience. And this was the EU referendum, and I woke up, that's what I woke up to, uh, and it said leave, and I was the worst experience ever in my life at the time. But anyway, that application was built through the web and deployed via notifications. No real web browser in sight. I think it's quite powerful. And then there's things like AMP. And I know a lot of people have issues with AMP, but the thing that I really like about AMP is it's brought a new way of embedding third-party content into first-party experiences. The traditional way of doing this is via iframes, and everyone knows the problems with iframes. They're slow, they're not amazingly secure, but we can bring in experiences where we can just take HTML, no JavaScript, because that's some of the constraints that they have, and they have a custom element uh, system there in place where they know the intent of what the user and author meant. An image carousel is an image carousel tag, so they can choose to render it how they want. And I think that's a really powerful thing. Whether you like AMP or not, I think the powerful thing there is that you get access to those kind of that data and you can embed it in new experiences. And then we get things like headless Chrome. Like we can build servers that run a browser which you can then start to interact with from your browser and like there's new different types of services. And the first one everyone built is a screenshot app. But you, like, you can run JavaScript, an entire application, you can run it inside your service-based experience as well. I think that's incredibly powerful. And the thing about the web is that you just type the URL in and you go. And like, we've got things like Google Home, which I actually tied at my desk. My desk was an absolute mess around here. It had like Starbucks cups and a whole bunch of other stuff. So my wife was quite clear, uh, pleased I cleaned my desk at the time. But the idea behind it is Google Home, it's really hard to get an experience onto Google Home. It's a new computing platform, a new computing device like the Alexa and like the Amazon Echo. But you can't get things onto it. But you can. I don't know whether the audio is on. Nope, doesn't matter. So there's no audio, but like I asked it a question, when is Nordic.js? It says from the website Nordic.js, the date is the 7th and 8th of uh, September. I think that's actually incredibly powerful, right? Like the web, we're not building for this device in particular, but we're able to pass the meaning from a page, be able to answer a user's question, and then give them the data. We don't have full interactivity. We can't submit data back into a form. Uh, through it, but I mean, that's, that's something you could work on in the future, right? I, something I'd love to be able to see, but I don't know whether it works at the moment. So, I think the web is incredibly powerful. I don't think I need to tell you all this, because we can reach nearly everybody, and we are nearly everywhere on every single platform. Like, we don't think that we're on the Google Home, but we get access to on the Google Home as well. So, I think that's incredibly powerful. So, we're good with distribution and reach, right? Like, we have... We, we know that we're in a good place, I just don't think we talk about it enough. We don't have a hyper-focus on speed, and I think that's one of the things uh, that we need to kind of talk about, and I know there's, uh, Ben is gonna talk about this a, lot, a lot about this later on, um, so I'm gonna only briefly cover this, and we need to focus on things like user experience as well. And I kind of wanna package this up, so I know we're saying that the future of the web isn't progressive web applications because progressive web applications are now, but I, who's built a progressive web app? One, two. Did you submit it to the directory? <laughs> We've got a directory. You should submit it to the PWA directory as well, just so we know about it. Um, but the idea behind it is that in 2015, Alex Russell and Francis Berryman coined the term for a collection of technologies and experiences that we want to see on the web. Um, so the idea is that the more you use these experiences, the more progressively installed they become on the device. So if you only have a one-off interaction with it, it's never installed on the device at all at that point. It's, it's, it's kind of an interesting model of how they do it. But when you think about the attributes of a progressive web application, they should be fast, they should load instantly and be available, they should be integrated and kind of wherever the user expects them, so on the home screen in all these other places. They should be reliable in the presence of poor devices, whether it's memory constraints, whether it's GPU constraints, or whether it's network constraints. Um, and they should be engaging. Like we should want the user to keep coming back to them, whether it's via push notifications or other mechanisms to kind of keep engaged with the user. So I think in terms of fast and kind of performance, when I spoke to Alex Russell, his phrasing was the amateurized cost of using a website should never exceed an experience elsewhere. So it's really hard to measure what fast means on a website for an experience, but the idea and kind of the thrust of what he was trying to say here is that if it takes 20 seconds to load a page, that's maybe not too bad when you compare 40 seconds to install an application, 
Um, but if it takes 20 seconds to do every other subsequent interaction, like that's 40 seconds straight away, you might as well just go and install the application at that point. And that's not the web that we want. We want the web to be instant, available, and accessible, uh, irrespective of connectivity at that point. So what does load quickly mean? I think that the general kind of thrust at the moment is that we have some constraints of what we think a fast load insight is. And the idea is you should be five seconds of time to interactive on first load on a slow device over 3G. And there's tools, there's a number of different tools that you can use to measure this and to be able to see whether your kind of device meets that. But the idea is that you want the experience to be kind of roughly interactable, scrollable, tappable, you know, usable within five seconds on any of these devices. And in theory, if you reload the page, it should be available instantly. Subsequent navigation should not cost the user in toll. And there's one API that kind of drives all this, the service worker. Now, who, who knows about service worker? Because I'm not going to go into too much depth. There's quite a few people. Cool. Um, so the idea for people who don't know, the service worker is just a small piece of JavaScript that kind of sits in between the browser and the operating system, and it can control different aspects of the device. So in one, in one particular aspect, it can handle notifications and a bunch of other stuff. But more importantly, every single HTTP request that goes through your website uh, you can control, you can decide what to do with it. And once you can decide what to do, you control the performance of your site and you, can and you can control the offline experience as well at the same time. I think that's incredibly powerful uh, and it's an API that I encourage everyone to start to look at. So I've built a number of different progressive web applications using um, obviously service workers at this point. And like, this was one of the things that I kind of like about this, the service worker is that it works, the application works everywhere. It's an, like, the idea is it's a progressive enhancement to the network. If you don't have service worker, which Safari still doesn't have service worker, the application still loads, is still accessible and is still usable. It's just like a traditional web application at this point. Uh, and there's a number of different ways that you can start to structure your application. And I kind of want to briefly go into them and just ignore the quality of this diagram. I was using an iPad pen thing and it, I'm rubbish anyway. Um, it's a normal application. The browser makes a request to the server. The server does some work, renders the layout of the page and sends it back to the, you know, back to the user's device. The user's device renders the content. But in the background, the service worker is starting to install and cache the content it needs to make sure that subsequent experience is available. Like it can cache data, cache assets, JavaScript, CSS, and all these different types of things. But it's asynchronous. So the web page can still go off. It can fetch the XML to go and get the kind of the latest feed content and render it back. It's just a normal, traditional kind of single page application at that point. But on the reload, this is where it kind of gets interesting. The user makes the request, it goes to the service worker, but I intercept that request. I can manage the network at that point and I can, get, I can decide what to do. And I'll just return it from the cache straight away. So I'll return the structure of the application directly to the user. Uh, and then what happens then is that the page obviously does its normal things. It goes, I need to get new content. I'll go and try and get new content for the network. I get it from the cache so I can render it out straight away and instantly to the user. And then behind the scenes, I'm like, well, I always do want to make sure that there is fresh content the next time that the user comes back so I can kind of asynchronously go and fetch the content and store it in an offline cache so that it's available the next time around. And the great thing with this is because I can control the network, I can deliver it to the user, I can still do it within that 100 milliseconds budget, which I think is incredibly powerful. But the more interesting thing is because, again, I control the network, like if the server goes away, like all the same logic still takes place, but when it tries to update the data, it just, it can't update the data, it's fine. I can deal with that and I can manage that type of experience. And that's the power that Service Worker brings to you and your users at that point. Now, there's things like the radic idea of radically uh, kind of better user experiences. Like, I, I don't want to kind of go in through this too much because a lot of it is feature-based at this point. Um, but we want to make sure web applications, when the user wants them to be integrated with the device, that they're integrated with the device, they are where the user expects them to be. And we want to try and remove friction at all costs. So, you know, if you install a home, uh, progressive web application, it, you know, in theory, it gets added to the home screen, it gets installed as a proper device uh, application, there we go. I should have paused the video um, so you can't see it properly. Um, once it's installed, 
It's actively like a native application on Android, at least. It's a web APK. So it will be available in all the places that you expect applications to be. So it'll be in the app launcher, uh, it'll be in the Android settings, and all those types of things. On desktop, it might be on the desktop. In Safari, it might just be a bookmark on the home screen at that point. And, and that's fine. We can still build good experiences with this. Obviously, we get the deeper engagement with push notifications. And this is an example of Twitter loading up. And because they can control the network, they can make that network load instant. Once you click on the notification, the Twitter Lite application is there straight away. And they're starting to see some really good metrics with, this, uh, with all these APIs coming through. Again, like the progressive web app model, it's not something new. It's like Ajax was a collection of technologies just applied to a pattern of application of how you push that onto the web. Progressive web apps are fundamentally the same. They're just better user experiences where you're combining a number of different APIs together to deliver something a lot more effective to the user. Essentially, it is just another good website at that point. But we're starting to see increases in engagement. Like we've got Twitter I've talked about a 65% increase in pages per session, and a massive increase in the number of tweets. This again is just they built a better website. This works across iOS and Android. iOS doesn't have all the features. They just built a faster, better experience at that point. And then things like sign-in, like we talked about sign-in before, being able to take credentials across devices, whether it's desktop to mobile. AliExpress in China, uh, they've been managing, you can't see it properly, but it's automatically signed in uh, at the bottom just there. Uh, I was given instructions not to put anything important here. Um, so yeah, anyway. Um, the idea behind it is the automatic sign-in kind of like, you, you have issues getting a user in, you have more issues having a user come back and remember all their details, and that API has massively smoothed things out. So they've got a 41% higher increase in signing rate and an 85% decrease in signing failure rate, which is just, it's important to them because you need to buy something and it goes through their normal, like when you buy something, you have to be checked in and signed in for it. So they see positive benefits about building just a better web experience. And the good thing is that in theory that this is just a progressive story. It works across every single browser. Like these experiences and progressive web applications are available in Firefox, Samsung browser, Opera, and they will be coming to Edge pretty soon. And as obviously we said before, you know, Safari have started to announce that they're working on service worker. What that actual service worker integration looks like, it might be a kind of installable model, it might not, but the thing it gives you is resilience. Like you can control the entire experience uh, that the user has on the web. And I think that's incredibly powerful. So we've got the distribution, we've got the speed. I think we can kind of like, we've got the benefits of the, like the, the overall user experience that we can deploy into the web as well which I think is pretty powerful. But what is the big problem that we still need to solve? Like, and this gets to my point about silos. I think we've got a fundamental problem on the web, and I think we've got an answer for it, um, which I kind of want to talk about. But there's a number of things, uh, the way I like to think about the web, ignore the progressive web app kind of mentality at the moment, is that there are some attributes of the web that kind of that differentiate from other platforms. It's secure by default. I, I know that we have content injection and a couple of other things, but the idea is that the web has a very pervasive uh, security model, and in theory, everything is sandboxed away. And that actually does present problems for IPC and inter-app communication, but it's a good thing to have on the platform. It's linkable. You, know, you can take a link and give it to someone, and you know, they can do whatever they want with it. It's indexable. Once you have that link, you can go and crawl the content. And it's not a binary blob. It's just normal content that we can extract meaning and intent from. It's composable, we can join different experiences together, and it's ephemeral as well, so that you don't have to actually install the experience. You can interact with it once, and that's it. And I think that's incredibly powerful, right? So they called it Slice. It's a model that Chrome, like Chrome like to think about the web. But there's a lot of other attributes, right? Like the web is updatable. There's no one central point of control. You know, it's accessible, like all these other different attributes. It just turns out things like SAD Nuclear Mice is the worst acronym to use ever for kind of the benefits of the web. So. There's a couple of things that I would like to talk about a little bit, uh, and this is the kind of the, the two problem, problem, I can't say the word problem. Um, they're the two areas of issue, <laughs> uh, linkable experiences and composable experiences. Like I want the web to be able to differentiate on making sure that we have experiences that can interact together really, really, really well. So we, ha we have links. I mean, everyone knows the link. Uh, it's like HTTP, whatever, uh, for the thing. And then you can have an anchor. Oh, sorry, the, there's the URL, sorry, which is the HTTP scheme and the, the address. And then you have an anchor, which is the link. Like, the anchor is the action. So it's basically saying, if you click this, you will view the content that is inside this API here, uh, this site here. And this kind of site can break down. You can build an API off the back of it. So you've got a products directory, and you've got maybe iPhone off the back. So you can get resource and state, and you can manage the entire thing. 
Uh, you can even do things like you know, submit to forms as well. So you've got REST, you've got GraphQL, a different number of different ways. But fundamentally, we have this piece of content which can address something on the web at that point, and we can start to interact with it, and we can do a number of different things. But I, I don't think that is enough. Just being able to view content and maybe do a post or a put to it, I don't think is enough for us to be able to have a future, like, like a long-term successful future on the web. I think we need to expose consistent, higher-level interactions to the user. So things like share, things like edit, things like pick. I want to pick an image from Google Photos and bring it into my application. That's what I want to see on the web, and I think we can do this because you don't have to go and install Google Photos to use it if the user doesn't have a photo application. We should still be able to find any other photo-based gallery on the web and be able to interact with that. And I think that's what we need on the web, and that's the thing that I'd like us to keep pushing for on the platform. Now, the interesting thing for me is that right now, we have to require a server, and I'm going to kind of talk a little bit about this, to do a lot of these more complex interactions. It is possible to do deep interactions with multiple different uh, third parties, but it is actually pretty hard to do. And I want us to do away with the server. I want these experiences to be client-based client interactions. So I like to think of the web, and again, this is my terrible drawing, um, as like a sea, <laughs> the, the internet is a sea, and the number of different islands on that. And each experience is its own kind of siloed piece. Like you can have operating system level functionality, you can have different websites, and they're all, like they're not really designed to talk to each other, they're completely isolated and managed in a different way. It's like each site is a server at this point. Again, I'm really good at really bad analogies. Um, but each site is a server at this point. And, or each site is a server, each island is a server, and it kind of operates independently. You don't have to interact with anything. You have something in the client, and you can talk to your server, and you can build a nice little service off the back of that, and that's fine. Um, but you know, you're on the web, you've got the same origin policy, which is like a kind of little castle. It's there to protect your island, so that if anyone tries to kind of like start to access content about session data and a bunch of other things, like the users can't start to do that at that point, which is incredibly powerful. But it is the natural thing that people want to do. They want to be able to go, I've got a client-based application, I want to go and get access to that piece of resource over there, like in a different server, I want to be able to access that content. The user signed in, I should be able to access it. But they can't, right? Like Cause, the cross-origin resource sharing API, is there to solve it, but the kind of the origin model prevents kind of the web from being able to reach into other applications and pull the data out. And Cause can solve this, but no one actually uses the Cause API. Everyone hates it and no one knows what it's for. So I don't know whether we kind of have a solution, but no one uses it, so it's probably not a solution. So what ends up happening is people build these server-to-server -server based interactions and experiences. So you kind of call your server via your own proprietary API, you go and connect to another server to pull the data in and kind of authenticate against it and bring it back in. And it's just incredibly complex. You have to do custom bespoke integrations with every single service that you want to integrate with. And I, I think that's a problem. I like to, instead, build, instead of building kind of tunnels between services, Again, worst analogy ever. Uh, I like to build bridges between them, go from client experience to client experience. And the reason why I quite like this is because you can start to think about building repeatable patterns. And bridges, they're built off repeatable patterns. We know how to build bridges repeatably and scale them out. Yes, some bridges are very bespoke and one-off bridges, but things like the Golden Gate Bridge and the 25th of April Bridge in Portugal, they're done by the same designer with the same model, even the same color scheme to actually build off these kind of these experiences, and I, I think that model and that analogy works well for the web, is that we should be able to kind of go over the top to different islands and be able to speak to them directly through the client to client, and I think there's a number of benefits about why you'd want to do this. We get to focus, in theory, on what we're good at. If we know there's a number of different services out there and they're already on the client device, we should be able to talk to them. We shouldn't have to keep re-implementing functionality. We should be able to do fast data transfer. The last thing that you want to do is send a 20 megabyte image to your server to then proxy it across to another server and deliver it to that service so that you can edit it in another application. We don't want to do that. We already have the data on our device. We should be able to deliver it to another experience at that point. And we should be able to do it even when we're offline. Like, if our applications are offline, but we know that they're on the device, Device, we should be able to talk to each of them. And for me, one of the interesting things is like, I don't like pulling code into my sites. I don't like pulling in, say, the Facebook shim or the, the Google Plus shim, all these different things. The minute that you start injecting code from another origin into your site, that's a security problem, that's a performance problem as well. So I like the idea of being able to kind of use and run code in the context of the other experience and have it run in a secure manner as well. And I think we can do that with some of the client-to-client -client interactions. But the interesting thing is that we already have the tools in place, and I'm going to go through this 
this really quickly because there's a lot of data to get through, is we already have a lot of the tools in place. The first one is a very simple thing, the sharing API. It is Chrome only at the moment. Uh, it will be coming to a lot of other platforms, but we can deliver basic information, text, URLs, and data from a website to another application. I mean, this doesn't help with the silos on the web because we're taking data out of the web and delivering it to a native app. That, that's pretty bad. But there's another kind of piece of a proposal to actually open up kind of every single website as a target for kind of a more complex interaction. Yes, we can open websites via a URL and click on them. Um, <clears throat> we can open those websites and click on those links. But the interesting thing is that we actually want to deliver more complex data to it in a relatively standard way. And the share target API is designed to make sure that your web application can be in every single sharing based interaction on the user's device. But fundamentally, there's a number of different APIs. There's pr pure primitives that have been on the platform for the last seven years. Post message is an interesting one. It's basic IPC message passing between workers, iframes, windows, service workers. Anything that's basically an origin context, you can share some data to it. But it's really hard to use, right? I mean, the standard thing that people use is they use a web worker and they take the window, instantiate a web worker, and they kind of like post messages to it. And the problem is that this is a really poor developer experience. This content here is you have to pass the command through and then actually have to work out how to deal with this. And if you've got a complex application, message passing is a really bad way to actually build applications. Uh, it's flexible, but you can't share that logic across different origins easily without having a complex API. And it gets more interesting, like windows can talk to other windows. You can have complex interactions with other windows. And like the model is roughly the same. Well, in theory, it's roughly the same. You open the window, you post a message, and you, you listen to the message, and you do something with it. But actually, that doesn't work, because the window that you open originally is about blank. You have to wait for it to load, because if you send the message to it, it doesn't actually receive. It's really complex. So you end up having to do this weird dance where the, the window says, all right, I'm ready. Right, send me some messages and come to, like the developer experience for this IPC is terrible. And it gets even worse, like maybe I want to send a message from a window to a window to some functionality in the worker. Like my site shouldn't have to know about the implementation of the worker. And it gets even more complex, I've got to open the worker up and then for every single message that I send through, I've got to route it through the window, the window's got, it's a horrible, horrible experience, right? There is an API, and I wish I'd known about this API when WebIntense was around. It's called Message Channel. You can define queues on the platform, two-way kind of pipes that you can kind of, well, you can actually pass them around between windows. It's incredibly powerful. And the, the problem with the API is it's explained terribly in the spec. It says a message port, uh, a part of the message channel, can be entangled with another. And that's pretty much all it says. It's a really weird way of describing an API. I think it's the most confusing thing. I, I kind of like to think about it as like subspace communication instead. So the idea is that you can, in one window, you can create a message channel. It's got two ends, like an input end and out. They've both got inputs and outputs, and you can send across them. But you can pass the message straight through to the window. So like the message port, like the, the thing that consumes the messages that are posted to it, you can pass to a window. Uh, you can pass it from the window to a worker, which means that my, my window here doesn't have to know about the worker, but it can still communicate with the logic. And I think that is actually incredibly powerful because you can get to the point, you might have a service worker that's running in the background, and you want to basically execute some code and some functionality in another service, which lives in a web worker, which does a fetch to get the data and pull it back in from like a different origin context. It's incredibly complex, uh, it's incredibly complex, some of the things that you can do with, but it's a very powerful API. And it's been on the platform for the last five years and no one uses it. So IPC on the web is absolutely, it's, it's terrible. The developer experience sucks really badly. Um, but there is a simpler way and I've only got a couple more slides, so we're in a good place. Um, we do have all the primitives. We have post message to deliver those messages. We have message channel to make sure that we can kind of connect between any different window worker, iframe, service worker, without having to know kind of where it's supposed to be routed to. And we have a new addition to the platform, well, relatively new, called the proxy API. And this API is a game changer. It allows you to do some really interesting things. So my, my colleague, Surma, uh, that's his only name. He's like the stick. Um, he created this project called Comlink. And the idea behind it is to make a simple way of doing simple RPC across anything that's got a message port. So rather than do kind of the message passing and really complex interactions and have to deal with all that kind of on-message handling, we changed the API to be something a little bit more sane and simple. You have a normal ES6 class, you expose it on the network, on the kind of the message port, and then you can, uh, on the client, you can obviously instantiate a proxy to be able to receive the kind of the definitions. You can instantiate via the proxy API uh, a new 
instance of the object, and the object runs in this context. The object is not available on that space at all. It's all running in the context of the remote origin at this point. And you can just start to call it. It's all asynchronous. And the way that it does it is it uses, like I said, this proxy API. The idea behind the proxy API is that you can basically start to interact with and interface with all the lower level constructs in the JavaScript subsystem. So when you say new, rather than actually call a new object, you call the kind of the constructor, so it's up here. You call the construct object here, and then you can decide what to do when you're creating an object. In, a, in our case, we kind of abstract all of that complex message passing away so that when you make a new object, it goes through to the remote origin, makes the origin in the other window. Um, when you kind of call a function, it calls apply, and it works out how to make sure that the call uh, to the remote function is actually made as well. And I, I think that's incredibly powerful. You can abstract away a huge amount of complex, uh, complexity with the, uh, with the proxy API. So, I do think that when we have this kind of abstraction, you can have services that live everywhere. We still need to do content resolution and a whole bunch of other things. We're not there yet as a complete kind of end-to-end -end solution. But if you have a proxy and you have a way of exposing ES6 classes to the web, that's cool. You can have them kind of, kind of come across from any different origin. But the thing I kind of like is maybe that you could get to the point where you could start to expose more native functionality. As long as they can define a basic class that you can start to interact with, you could potentially connect to a native service and start to pull in that data and that function. So I, I kind of want us to get to this point where we do hype, like, I want to say hyperconnect. I hate the word, actually. But like, we have hyperlinks. I want us to be a lot more integrated between our services. Like, if we're more integrated between our services, then we start to break down silos. We don't have to rely on us building the complete full vertical stack to build complex applications. I think the platform is incredibly capable. I think we've got more and more features, and yes, some browsers lag behind, and it takes longer for these things to come through, but we've really, really kind of made a massive push and a great, I say a great leap forward, that's the wrong phrasing, sorry. <laughs> we've made a massive leap uh, in terms of the capabilities and the richness of those experiences that we can deliver. And when you combine all those features and functionalities together, I think, and you kind of frame it as the progressive web app model, um, and as the way of building applications, I think we have a really good model for delivering fuller, richer, more reliable, instant loading experiences to the web. And I think that is actually pretty powerful. My hope is that you, as an audience, uh, you, know, you start to build these applications and you start to work on these types of experiences. My goal is that my team can create all the guidance and the tools that you need to be able to kind of deliver these experiences. So if you ever need help, obviously you can reach me. Um, but we've also got a developer portal at developers.google.com uh, slash web. And with that, I would like to thank you all very much.